Well, uh, to go into that, let's, let's talk about what it is that we learned in writing it. And one of the things we learned in writing it was that Marshall hadn't really thoroughly understood what the technological model for communication was, which was uh, the Shannon Weaver model, uh, which I had used as an engineer and had known Shannon uh, in the Bell Labs because I had been liaison for Ericsson with Bell Labs and I knew most of these people who were involved in the new technologies. And this was one of the things uh, that is the Shannon approach to matching outputs to inputs with given telecommunication facilities that was extremely important for us. And uh, so I pointed out to him that this had become, as it were, an all-embracing model for all communication in all the schools of the world. And that indeed the, the, and no other model existed so far as the universities were concerned. The assumption being that if you match the output of a circuit to the input, then you could match the one human mind with, the, with whatever it was and another human mind and the, that would be perfect communication. And the problem that Marshall immediately spotted was the word matching. That in human communication you never match anything, you remake the experience. And that the way he always started, and this is what struck me immediately because I've never started this way myself, is what is the sensory experience of the communication process? What happens to the people involved in it, in their sensory lives? Well, as soon as you ask that question, it opens up a whole new way of examining what goes on. And in writing Take Today, we <coughs> Uh, spotted it in this way, we formulated it this way. He hadn't, he'd come up with the medium as a message, as a way of drawing attention. It was an exaggeration, uh, a rhetorical hyperbole, that drew attention to the power of the medium to transform your intention into whatever was the result, the result was a message. And if you think of the message as the result, as the totality of the effects, then you are beginning to come to grips with what human communication is about. And that is, we then reformulated it uh, based upon long discussions, but also upon our experience with Baudelaire. Hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère, had been long known as the hypocrite, was the actor, Greek actor, Lecter, reader, my likeness, mon semblant, mon frère, my brother. Let us put on this poem and share it together and make sense of it. All right. Now that process of making sense then was uh, putting on the media, the, the program in the medium and making sense of that relationship between whatever it was on the medium and yourself. That was the sense. So, it, to simplify this in language and the process that we began to uh, spot was uh, the intention, which is internal. The medium, uh, the uh, choice you make of, of bringing that intention out, at what medium you're using, and how you program it to share that, the experience that is uh, with the language of that medium the language of that medium. Now, what was the meaning? The meaning was the sense you made of it, and each person made different sense of it, depending upon what that person brought to it. And what was the message? The totality of the effects, regardless of the intention. But the important thing was, what was the content? Well, for the technological process, the content was the program. That is, matching the input program and the output program. This was matching the content, the signals, the dots that you sent and the dashes or the spaces and the marks or whatever scheme you used to match them, input to output, output to input rather. Now, the content of all human communication is the people, not the program. So that they put on 
the medium, which is programmed in a certain way by someone who wishes to reinforce through that medium the experience, which is the totality of the effects. And uh, the meaning for each person will be different and they'll never match. Nobody will ever have the same experience as anybody else. Why? Well, because percepts which are our direct encounter with human experience as it is, our direct encounter with this world as it is, in human terms, with human experience as it is, is individual. And it's never repeated. Never repeated. What is repeated is the similarity. That is, human beings who are brought up in a similar context have similar experience in similar contexts with similar programming. But they're never identical. And it is to understand where these vary that you need a language which tells you what to look out for. And the language is the language of the Gestalt psychologists, which we then uh, began to develop. In the previous writing of Marshall, it was, uh, he was uh, drawing attention to environment, counter-environment. He was looking at the environment, which is the media. The medium is an environment. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that you put on. And the counter-environment is something you invent, to, if you like, to, to expose it. It's a, but that the terminology, while it's uh, useful, isn't, uh, shall I say, as uh, uh, sharp in revealing the situation as the figured ground terminology, which simply says that anything that you select to study is a figure. Anything. And everything else is ground. And you can't possibly uh, experience everything else you can experience part of it, and then you, if you try to share that with someone else, you try to describe it in terms of some medium, or share it in terms of some medium. It is not the experience that you're sharing, it's the description of the experience. And the same thing occurs with the, the figure. The figure that you take out to study is a description, it, when it's shared with somebody else. It is not what that experience was, but it is the way you it, try to share that in some language with somebody else. Well, as soon as you begin to look at uh, human communication that way, then you know, well, first of all, that nothing has any meaning alone, but only in its relationship to a ground which tends to remain hidden. It is the ground of your culture, it's the ground of the world in which you live and uh, which you may or may not be aware of. But nevertheless, that is what makes sense or meaning for each person. And the same thing with the message. Nobody can foretell what the message will actually be. But as an artist with the experience of human communication, you can anticipate the effect of human communication by asking the question, all right, what will its physical effects be? What will its psychological effects be? What will its social effects be? In so far as I can foresee them. In sharing this with somebody else, I can find a whole range of things which I myself won't know, but somebody else may experience. And together, we begin to get, uh, by making an inventory of these effects, we begin to make them manifest. Uh, and because a manifest is, after all, an inventory. And it is this inventory of effects which is how we come to understand anything in human terms. Not through an argument uh, between let us assume this is so and then find out what the consequence of this assumption is, which is the way we must proceed with conceptual analysis, but in the opposite direction. We have a certain experience that we who know is unique and that we would like to share it with someone else by some means that we can discover that will bring them to an understanding such as we have. This is human communication and as Marshall once said to me, it's a miracle, Barry. It's not quite impossible, but it very seldom happens. So that to communicate anything new requires an enormous, if you like, uh, extension of our effort
to manifest what this uh, new experience is in terms which you can share with other people. This is the nature of human communication and the poets are aware of it. <coughs> For that matter, the musicians and the painters, to some extent, more than some of them are more articulate about it and are more conscious about it than others. But this is the process. So that in art, then, you start with the desired effects and you create the causes which will give you those effects insofar as you're able to understand the process. In science, on the other hand, you start with presumed causes and you look for effects that will contradict this. And then you go back to the drawing board with another theory. <coughs> so that when Marshall said he has no theories, he simply was saying, I don't start with a presumption that I have found the causes. But only with the use of this term, cause, as a probe to explore what other things are at work. <coughs> and by doing this, we can then get a grasp on what is manifest. As any fool can plainly see, I can see it, says little of it. Okay? Now, that doesn't require uh, uh, technical dexterity. <coughs> it requires human perception. Now, perception is, as St. Thomas Aquinas understood, a relation among relations apprehended, grasped yeah, in our sensory lives and is constantly changing. It's not fixed. And uh, so that we get in then to this whole range of human uh, understanding in terms of perceptual rather than conceptual terms without rejecting the concepts but simply uh, putting them on the, uh, shall I say, on hold and saying that percept precedes concept and concepts are simply packages of similar percepts brought together for convenient use and can often be very inconvenient and let you look behind them. Now, the next stage in this whole process is to recognize the difference between the nature that man created and the nature which he, in fact, is an extension of. So we are the extensions of the nature that, uh, if you like, God made, if you think in terms of divinity, the nature which we inherited, the nature of which we are an extension, we all share with every living being. <coughs> and non-living being too. And the question of how we understand that is what it manifests to us. Okay, that's how we understand it. The question of the nature that we make, which is all of our artifacts, whether they're hardware or software, whether they're systems of management or philosophy or logic or mathematics or they are articles such as pens or pencils or apples or oranges, whatever we grow or whatever we uh, have created by our own efforts, are in fact by their very existence demonstrably communication media because we can ask ourselves the question, what is it, <coughs> first of all, what is it that they do in the environment, physically, psychologically, and socially? That's the first question we can ask. And we can ask a question which we later discovered to be equally important is the uh, <clears throat> not thinking in terms of merely either or logic, is it this or is it that, but in the Heraclitean sense of it is both this and that at the same time. In the logic, if you like, of uh, what we call acoustic space, that is, a space which cannot be divided, which has centers everywhere and boundaries nowhere. The space that the pre-literate man lived in, and for that matter, post-literate man, and indeed the space of nature before we package it, that is the nature of which we ourselves are an extension. That is acoustic space, but in structure, it is like the space that the ear operates in or the oral tactile space. And the visual space is simply that which the eye sees, the space in which the eye operates, where no two things can be in the same place at the same time, and every 
Uh, everything has its private point of view, its center, wherever you are, and its boundaries, wherever they are, its horizons or limits. All right. Now, these ideas of visual and acoustic space are uh, fundamental because with them go <coughs> the logic of structure that means all together, all at once, with the Heraclitean, if you like, sense of both and. Everything is both something and something else at the same time. And the Aristotelian space, which says that a thing cannot both be and not be something at the same time. It must be either this or that, that is categorically, which is only possible in, shall I say, man-made thinking. It is an artifact of the way we think logically in our Western world. And this arose as a result, as Marshall certainly pointed out, and was not the first to do so, was, uh, there are many others, that it is, arose as a result of the Greek phonetic alphabet, which demanded from the students that they learn to make sense of, uh, they learn to make sense of um, the phone phonemes, the sounds of the Greek characters, which had no visual or acoustic semantic meaning. And once they went through that process, then they began to think uh, not only logically of how to construct a language and a literature out of that, but also sequentially, and began to, in other words, think in uh, logical sequential terms. Now this was Western civilization, and this is what the Greeks founded. It doesn't exist in any other culture to that degree, although it does exist in a lesser, or shall I say, other degree. And you can do this by studying the cultures as, and the effects of their modes of writing and communication upon their modes of thinking. That we can deal with. Eric Havelock has dealt with it extremely well, and we don't need to embark on it now. The uh, <coughs> thing that we need to embark on is the next stage, and this is the one I'd like to open up for our future discussion among all of us in this world, and that is that Every human artifact, everything made by man, woman, or child, is something that serves and acts as a communication medium. And its power as a communication medium can be studied by asking four basic questions, which is what does it enhance or accelerate or, or magnify? Uh, what does it obsolesce? What does it um, erode? Or, wipe out? And what does it retrieve of similar nature? Similar. Previously, if you're like, obsolesced or put on the back burner, as it were, and is now being revived for the, with a new meaning in the new context. Notice, a new meaning because there's a new context since it was last obsolesced. And we also know uh, that well, what does it become when you push it to extreme? Now, there are two ways of asking this que question. One is the way of the uh, rhetorician, and the other is the logician. The rhetorician asks very simply that whatever you push to extreme uh, reverses in language and in behavior, in human behavior. You can ask it in the Hegelian sense of the transformation of quantity into quality and, uh, uh, and uh, vice versa, quality into quantity. Uh, this is in the Hegelian categories. You get these reversals or transformations occurring in nature also. And it's easy enough to see that if you uh, raise the temperature of ice, you get water and water, you get steam and so on. You get these transformations occurring in nature, uh, which you must expect if you uh, take anything, either in nature or any artifact made by man, and uh, change its context, then you will change its behavior. And this is so obvious that it seems hardly necessary to state it, but there it is. So if you use this kind of questioning, you begin to get a manifest, okay, in either the well, first one, which is the physical, psychological, and social effects, and you can put that in on the four basic questions and say, let's make a manifest for each one of these questions, which is what does it enhance, what does it magnify, what does it... Uh, uh, obsolesce, what does it uh, erode, what does it retrieve of similar nature, and you can make a manifest of each of these, and what does it flip into, or reverse, in, or reverse into, or become, if you push it to extreme, you can make a manifest of that too. 
And you can make it through our entire human experience and in so doing gain the kind of experience that is what you might call a, an understanding that goes far beyond the questions that are being asked by mathematicians and philosophers and people who are trying to define the nature of those things which make life worth living. And my contention is that nothing that makes life worth living can be defined. It can only be experienced. It is perceptual, not conceptual. And I would go further and say, and this is the nature of intelligence, which is forever beyond the two-bit width of the computer, and those who advocate artificial intelligence as, shall I say, the outcome of our culture and its future. And I would go further and add this, that we must be able to understand how it works on the one hand, and on the other hand, how the human sensibilities work, and this is what I like to call comprehensive awareness, which embraces both and doesn't throw away anything. It simply throws away the assumption that you can reduce all of our understanding to one or the other. It requires both. Thank you very much.